afternoon, everybody. Got a couple of quick scheduling notes up top here before I take your questions. Uh, as you know, today, President Obama presented uh, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kettles with the Medal of Honor at the White House for his hero heroism back in May of 1967 during the Vietnam War. Tomorrow, Secretary Carter will host a ceremony here at the Pentagon to induct Lieutenant Colonel Kettles in the Pentagon's Hall of Heroes. On Wednesday, Secretary Carter will host colleagues from more than 30 nations at Joint Base Andrews for a ministerial meeting on the campaign against ISIL. And as you know there, additional meetings of uh, officials from coalition nations are happening this week, additional meetings, including a session involving both foreign and defense ministers that will be hosted by Secretary Kerry at the State Department. Secretary Carter is looking forward to that discussion as well. Secretary is eager to share information on the status of the campaign to discuss next steps in the military plan and to identify with members of the counter-ISIL coalition the next steps we can take to accelerate military progress in that campaign. And that progress has continued over the weekend. Members of the Syrian Arab Coalition freed additional territory in the city of Manbij in the face of determined resistance from ISIL. Those forces captured Manbij Hospital, which is being used by ISIL as a command and control center. The hospital was contested for some time, and it was a significant challenge for these forces operating in Manbij to expel ISIL from the building without doing major damage. They have succeeded in that effort, and so once the city is secured, the hospital will be returned to local civilian control so it can once again serve city residents. Meanwhile, in Iraq, security forces continue to clear territory near the Kiara West, uh, Kiara West airfield in preparation for operations to eject ISIL from Mosul. They've cleared additional territory in the vicinity of the airfield and on either side of the Tigris River. And this is another significant step forward for Iraqi security forces, again, in a crucial part of the campaign against ISIL. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Idris. Yeah, um, quick question. As the Defense Secretary has spoken with his Turkish counterpart um, after the attempted coup, and um, if he has, uh, you know, what was discussed? Um, he has not spoken directly with uh, the Minister of Defense. As you know, the uh, Turks have been invited to participate in uh, Wednesday's meeting. He spoke recently with the Minister of Defense at the Warsaw uh, summit. They had an excellent bilateral conversation then, and uh, he looks forward to talking with the minister in coming days. On the Angelic Air Base, I believe um, power has still not been restored. Yeah, uh, my understanding, power has not yet uh, been restored, um, but our operations there do continue, and we're going to continue to take whatever steps we need to to try and mitigate uh, uh, any impact that there could be on the campaign itself. Do you know why the power was first cut off, and, and how much longer it would take? Um, my understanding is that the power issue is something that is outside the walls of the base itself, so I'll leave it to the Turkish officials to describe to you uh, what's happening with, in terms of the effort to restore power and what led to the outage in the first place. Tony. Could you talk to the, a little bit about the operations going on there, the counter ISIL operations, in terms of what types of airplanes mm -hmm. RF-16s still operating out of there, and you know, roughly how crucial is Inserlik to the kinetic aspects of the campaign? They were quite crucial last year. Are they less crucial now, or just give a sense of that? Uh, Tony, uh, uh, we've talked to in the past about uh, some of the platforms there. I'm not going to get into specific numbers of aircraft, but we've had um, refueling aircraft. We've also had uh, attack aircraft as well. Um, and uh, uh, Insulik is obviously an important part of our military campaign, and uh, we've used it uh, very effectively. Um, and uh, we appreciate, of course, uh, the Turks' willingness to uh, allow us to fly operations out of there, the coalition as a whole. It's not just uh, U.S. aircraft. And uh, it will continue to be an important part of the campaign. We were able to conduct the campaign previously without having Inserlik. We have the ability to adjust uh, our uh, operations in such a way that we can account for uh, problems or, or delays there. And so we will adjust as we need to to make sure we keep the pressure on ISIL, that we keep our operations going. Um, and we are very thankful uh, uh, that the coalition is able to, to adjust in other ways uh, should there be um, any sort of delay or, or uh, some sort of impact on our operations going forward. Can I ask you, too, that given all the chaos over on Friday, were at any point U.S. conventional munitions or so-called special munitions that arms control advocates talk about endangered in the base in terms of being taken by the, the coup plotters and the coup participants? Uh, Tony, I will just say broadly that we've taken appropriate steps 
um, to maintain the safety and security of our personnel, uh, our civilian and military personnel, uh, their families, uh, and our facilities. And uh, we will continue to do so. Just a quick one on Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Two weeks ago, the president announced a retention of an additional <clears throat> 2,900 troops. This building has yet to come up with the incremental cost of what those 2,900 will cost. Mm -hmm. Do you have a figure? And if not, why can't they come up with the dollar figure at this point? Uh, Tony, it's a conversation that I know we're uh, continuing to have and will have on an ongoing basis with Congress, of course, which uh, uh, authorizes that money. And uh, when we've got uh, more for you, we'll let you know. Why can't you come up with a figure, though? I mean, it's, this is pretty by rote over the last decade about how much per troop cost in Afghanistan. Tony, right. as you know, these we want to be precise in our figures. We want to make sure we provide the most accurate information to members of Congress and to the, uh, the national security team as to exactly what this is going to cost and the best way, most efficient way uh, to fund those needs. We are um, confident that we will get the support of Congress for this effort we have in the past. This has been a, an effort in Afghanistan that's uh, won bipartisan support uh, in the past, and uh, we'll have those conversations with Congress at the appropriate time. You agree that they need a number in order to give you support, right? Uh, absolutely, and, and we're, we'll have that uh, conversation with them with the best information we have. Uh, at the appropriate time. Tara. Is it a true surprise the U.S. military personnel on base and for the Turkish military officials, um, some of whom have been rounded up in the last few days from Insurwood, were any of those officials uh, people that the U.S. was coordinating the counter ISIL strikes with? Um, first of all, I think it's fair to say that the uh, attempted coup was a surprise to, to us as it was uh, to people in Turkey and elsewhere. Um, and uh, with regard to your, your other question, uh, I'll leave it to the, to the Turks to describe who was involved and who was not involved. But I think it's fair to say that uh, we have excellent close relations with uh, the Turkish military. We will continue to have uh, close relations with the Turkish military. And as for who was involved and who was not involved, I leave that again to Turkish authorities to describe. What were the first indications for the military personnel on base that a coup was happening, and what were the immediate actions taken for um, personnel and aircraft there? Yeah, I, I don't have an immediate readout for the TikTok as to what was happening. Um, obviously, there were news reports in Turkey itself uh, of events that were playing out, and uh, so I, I do not know the first inclination that our folks had that something was going on, but obviously they had uh, publicly available information uh, over the news media in Turkey that something was happening. Two bases, are there still about 2,500 U.S. personnel in Turkey? Um, uh, the number between, uh, between the two is, uh, our number has not changed. There hasn't been any additional people, but I think our overall number uh, is larger than that and, and has been for some time. So it's, it's more than 3,000 people. Barbara. In answer to Tony's question, when he asked about, and I think his words are the chaos on Friday night, you said that the U.S. has taken appropriate action to secure everything. Maybe not a TikTok, but can you tell us any single action, military action that you had to take, that the department had to take, to ensure the security of U.S. weapons, aircraft, personnel? Did, did anything happen additionally since Friday night to secure all of that? Um, Barbara, as I just repeat, we took the appropriate steps. I, I can tell you that we did elevate our force protection level um, at our facilities in Turkey. Um, I'm not going to walk through exactly what that uh, entails, um, but we took the appropriate steps to make sure our people were as safe as possible. We've gone through an accountability review right now, and all of our people are accounted for, for example. and. Uh, that uh, took us some time to account for both our UCOM and CENTCOM personnel. So, if I could just follow up on a couple of points, um, what is your current, uh, the current assessment of central command and control by the Turkish military over Turkish forces? Where, not, not their view, your view. Do you believe they are in full control of their military? I'm going to leave the Turkish authorities to describe their current. Uh, command and control. The Turkish government is in charge. Um, and I'll defer to the Ministry of Defense of Turkey to describe 
uh, their current situation. But we are continuing to have uh, operate within Turkey, and we are continue to to engage with the the Turkish military. Obviously, there's been a significant amount of, of turmoil in that country, and uh, and so I'm going to defer those questions to the Turks. Well, with respect, Peter, with you know more than uh, 2,500 U.S. troops in Turkey, dozens of warplanes, special mm -hmm. weapons. Certainly, there must be some assessment for the Secretary of Defense about the command and control that the Turks have over their military. Can you give us any indication of what the defense, U.S. Defense Department thinks about this at the moment? We continue to operate, Barbara, uh, in Turkey, and uh, we continue to engage with the, the Turks, and uh, um, that will continue. And again, I'm going to leave the situation in terms of the the, the the turmoil in Turkey and the and the um, the questions that were raised with the, the events on Friday, I'll leave that to the Turks. Um, but we continue our operations in Turkey, and we're satisfied that uh, our forces uh, and our um, uh, our people, uh, with the proper precautions, will continue to be safe in Turkey. But it doesn't sound like you're saying. And I'm sorry, I have one very other quick follow-up. It doesn't sound like you're willing to say that you have faith and confidence that the Turkish military right now is in full control of their military force. We don't have any indication that the Turkish military does not have control. Um, we will continue to work closely with the uh, with uh, Turkey. This is a NATO ally, Barbara, as you know. This is a, a member of the ISIL coalition, and uh, we look forward to a continued uh, working relationship with, uh, with the Turks. Um, it's been a good relationship, um, obviously one that has helped uh, in the counter-ISIL campaign. It's one the Secretary was very engaged with in Warsaw with his counterpart, had a very good and productive meeting with his Turkish counterpart, where they talked about the next steps in the counter-ISIL campaign in particular, and, uh, and we don't see any reason why that can't continue. Can I just have one quick one on another subject? Um, this is the last one, and then i got to go to others. I promise. Um, so um, we've had two back-to-back -back shootings in the United States with the uh, people who had prior U.S. military service. No one I, I know of suggests their military service played any role in their criminal actions. But that said, two back-to-back -back ones, and people are curious about all of this. Is there any indication that the department might be thinking about reviewing how it conducts mental health assessments, either coming in during service or leaving service? Barbara, as you said at the top of your question, I not aware of any information that their military service uh, necessarily played any role in the events, tragic events that have played out in Baton Rouge and, and in Dallas. And in fact, you can look at the, the victims in those instances, and there are people who served in the U.S. military as well. So um, I, I'm not aware of a connection here at this point, and I don't, um, I don't want to suggest that there is one. Uh, so uh, in light of that, Again, I'm not, I'm not sure I have an answer to your question here. I'm not sure of the need for us to review something because I'm not aware that any connection has been made. Christina. Thanks, Peter. Um, when you say operations do continue in Turkey, does that mean um, all planes that were flying before are, are flying now? Or are you talking specifically about all air operations? Have full air operations continued? Um, I'm not aware of any impact on uh, specific aircraft. Um, we've been able to recover our aircraft, and there have been additional uh, takeoffs as well. Um, remember, this is part of a wider air campaign that involves uh, multiple locations, um, and this is a situation where we'll, we'll continue because of the power situation to look at very closely to see if we meet, need to make adjustments. The good news is, thanks to our partners, uh, our coalition members, and uh, our flexibility, we are able to make adjustments, as we did over the weekend, uh, to account for, for changes going forward. When you say recover, you mean just take full control over the aircraft? I mean, planes landing. So, okay. so. And then, um, just on Tony's question, um, when you talk about the number for the extra additional um, Afghan troops, does that mean that there will be some sort of request that number will be tied uh, to, or are you looking within the budget to find? These are, these are the questions that we're looking to, or we're talking with our partners within the uh, administration, other agencies uh, as well, OMB, of course. Uh, and a conversation we're going to have with Congress on the most efficient and best way to, to fund those forces. What we are remain confident is that uh, this is a mission that has been 
uh, funded previously by uh, bipartisan Congresses in the past, and we expect that that will be the case going forward. Jamie. Uh, I'm not sure. I, uh, help us understand what the actual impact was of this uh, attempted failed military coup. I, I know you you basically described that you're back up and running and things are going, but to what extent did it affect the operations? Were there uh, sorties that were canceled that had to be transferred to other? Were there, you know, what was what was the impact, however minimal, on the operations of Insulin? Uh, Jamie, just broadly, um, there was a period of time when we were not able to fly when the Turkish airspace was closed to military aircraft. Um, that did affect our plans for the day, our tasking order for the day. So in some cases, we had to look for aircraft at other locations to conduct certain missions. Um, this is all tied together. This is all carefully linked together, carefully planned. Um, yet there are some redundancies, and we are able to adjust. Uh, but clearly, it uh, would be our preference to be able to conduct operations without uh, any risk of, uh, of, of a delay or inefficiencies at, at Inserlik. Um, that was not the case this weekend for a portion of the time, and we had to adjust. Is there a limit to how long you can operate just on internal power with generators uh, if, 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 the, if the external power doesn't come back on? There, as I said, there are redundancies. Um, this, is, uh, this is something we do plan for. Uh, and we'll continue to assess the situation if it uh, reaches a point where we decide that we need to make other adjustments um, because we do not see power being uh, restored in a, in a quick enough fashion, then we, we will adjust accordingly. We are hoping to have power restored and to maintain uh, operations at, at Inserlik, but we will adjust as needed. And one last, just a quick follow-up. There have been some reports of, of anti-American sentiment in, in the wake of of the events of the, of the weekend. Are you concerned at all about the security of U.S. personnel or families or, or dependents? And are there still dependents at the bases in Turkey? Um, my understanding is that there are about 100 dependents that are uh, in Turkey. As you know, there was uh, the order of departure of uh, most of our dependents, particularly tied to Inserlik uh, previously. Um, and, Jamie, force protection, you've heard it from me before, is job one for us. Uh, everywhere in the world we operate, uh, including here at home, and uh, will continue to be, uh, be so. so. But we are confident that the measures we have in place uh, and the support we're receiving from uh, the Turkish government um, is adequate to address any security concerns we have at this time, but we'll continue to watch it very, very closely, as you would expect we would. Lucas. Turkish Defense Minister, will you still be attending the counter-ISIS meetings at Andrews? Um, I'll leave that to the Turks um, to, to describe. I know that they've been uh, invited, and we expect the Turks will be represented in some way. You mentioned that the U.S. military has been able to bounce back since the coup against the ISIS war, but are you, is the Secretary concerned that Turkey, this is actually a step back for them, that they will not be able to support the coalition in ways they had previously? Well, the Secretary certainly, um, again, he had, as I said, Extensive conversation with his Turkish counterpart in Warsaw, talked about a number of issues, including uh, the counter-ISIL campaign. Uh, absolutely. Um, we don't have any indication at this point that, uh, that the discussions that he had there and the, uh, and the, the outlook that uh, the two shared with regard to the fight against ISIL won't continue. Um, but I'll leave it to the, to the Turkish Minister of Defense to describe their own uh, activities and actions going forward. Secretary spoken to his Turkish counterpart since this coup attempt? Um, there's a lot going on in Turkey right now, as you know. Uh, a lot of things uh, within the country itself, within the government itself. And uh, the Secretary is absolutely looking forward to uh, engaging with the Minister of Defense um, and looks forward to doing so in the near future. Uh, it just it hasn't happened at this time, but um, there's no significance to that other than they just have not spoken. Tell us about the Secretary's initial reaction to the coup attempt. Did he watch this on TV like everybody else, or does he think there's some kind of uh, intelligence failure on part of the U.S. military that this couldn't have been, he didn't have a heads up, or was he getting regular reports from his intelligence units? Well, absolutely, the Secretary was uh, being regularly informed about what was happening, but I think it's fair to say that, uh, uh, that the Secretary was uh, surprised by, by the activities on, on Friday. Um, as others in the U.S. government were. And uh, obviously, this was a cause for concern, and he was getting regular updates on what was happening. Of course, primary concern for us in this situation is, uh, as we've been talking about, our service members and our civilians. 
Uh, and so uh, he was making sure that every step uh, that could be taken was being taken to ensure their safety. And lastly, switching gears over to Iraq, uh, the <laughs> firebrand uh, Shia cleric uh, al Sadr has threatened uh, U.S. troops. Is the Secretary concerned that the, the war in Iraq is now expanding to include these Shia militias now that this um, well, fatwa or whatever you want to call it has been extended to U.S. forces? Um, I'll go back to what I just said about force protection. Um, obviously, it's a concern if uh, anyone's uh, threatening uh, U.S. forces, um, but it's something we prepare for. Uh, we've worked very closely with the, the government of Prime Minister Abadi. Um, we are working at the invitation of the Iraqi government, working hand in hand in our train advi and, and advise uh, and assist mission. And uh, we'll continue to do that, and we'll take every step we need to to protect our people if needed. Uh, and we're more focused, quite honestly, on uh, the good work being done by the Iraqi security forces right now, the progress they're making um, with the help of the United States and other members of the coalition. Uh, we're making good progress. They're making good progress. And uh, that's where our focus is. Is there any worry in this building that the war in Iraq could be expanding? Um, there is a hope that the war against ISIL is expanding, and there is a sincere interest, and you'll see it reflected Wednesday at this meeting, um, that that effort will accelerate, and, uh, and everything we've seen from our recent visit to Iraq indicates that that's the focus of Prime Minister Abadi, and it should be the focus of everyone in Iraq as well if they want to get rid of the common threat uh, that ISIL poses uh, to the people of Iraq. Yes, Paul. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, this is a follow-up on Tony's question, if, uh, any, if the U.S. has stepped up security at any of any of the weapons that may be stationed at Incirlik, um, or whether the um, events over the weekend have caused any rethink on whether it's appropriate to have those kind of weapons there. I, I'm not going to talk about our strategic assets anywhere in the world. Um, as uh, you've heard me say, um, we've taken the prudent uh, steps that need to be taken to make sure that our people uh, our facilities, uh, their families are protected and uh, in the safest place possible. And we will continue to do what we need to to make sure that happens. Andrew. Um, Peter, you said that the Secretary has not had a conversation with his Turkish counterpart. Have there been any uh, communications initiated or received from mill to mill channels between the Defense Department and the Turkish military? Um, I think it's fair to say there have been conversations. I'm not going to read out each and every one. Obviously, we have a permanent presence uh, in Turkey itself. Um, but, uh, Andrew, at the same time, there's been a lot going on in Turkey. And I think, I think it's fair to say that uh, Turkish officials have been fairly busy with uh, uh, accounting for what's happened the last few days. And uh, so in general, like uh, what those communications, have they been about operations at the base? Have they been about um, the, the existing authorities that we have and continue to exercise? What, what, what have, in general, what have the substance of those communications been? Uh, again, yeah. I'm not going to read out all those conversations, but you know what we're trying to do with uh, Insulik in terms of trying to restore uh, power to the base. We've been in conversations specifically about the takeoffs and, uh, and landings, the recovery of our aircraft at Insulik. So uh, it's been... Uh, operational. Uh, it's about safety and security, and uh, and we'll have ample opportunities to talk with our Turkish counterparts going forward. Just one more: if there's any concern that the uh, authorities that we've worked out with them over the past 18 months, uh, in terms of using facilities and airspace and all that, is there is any of that under new discussion? Is there any concern uh, in the building that that somehow the arrangement that we've had for the past few months may be? Uh, under reconsideration? Um, I'm not aware of any. Um, again, the Secretary just had an excellent conversation with the, uh, the Minister of Defense uh, for Turkey about our operations there and about our collaboration together, and uh, we look forward to continuing that conversation. Quick follow-up on Andrew's question, since the electricity is still out, how are uh, the housing U.S. side of it able to light runways and things? Are they using backup generators for taxiway lights, for the tower? Um, how we have, we have uh, backup power sources. So. Yes. Peter, you know, the, the events in Turkey started at 10 o'clock in the p.m. In, on Friday. And then the UCOM issued a force protection condition level delta 
the Saturday morning at around seven, eight or something. What triggered, you know, this decision uh, at Saturday morning when the coup was nearly over? I think they were taking. We were already. We have excellent force protection to begin with, uh, and uh, I'm not even sure the exact timeline you mapped out, but I know that uh, UCOM uh, commanders were doing what they thought was appropriate uh, in light of the uncertain situation to protect our people uh, at, uh, uh, in every way that they could. And uh, so those, that decision, if it was made on, at that particular time, just reflected the European uh, UCOM's uh, decision on what the most appropriate step would be in terms of security for our people. And also the, the commander, one of the senior commanders in the, in the injury air base was allegedly inf involved in this coup attempt. And two of the tankers well, you know, launched from the air base were um, refueling the, the, this uh, coup-linked coup aircraft over Ankara and Istanbul. Was the UN, United States aware of this aircraft um, flying from Angelic to refuel the coup aircraft? And you, also, do you have you're any suggesting that a coalition aircraft did a refueling? That is not correct. No, no, Turkish tankers flying from Angelic were refueling the coup aircraft. So uh, I, I'm not aware of those details. But again, as you know probably better than most, this is a Turkish air base where we are a, uh, guests, we are tenants, and there are Turkish air operations at Inserlik. And so I leave it to the Turks to describe what activities on the part of their aircraft. You, the, you know, the U.S. military was concerned in terms of the chaotic situation over there. I mean, we, we were, of course, concerned enough that we elevated our force protection. Uh, so this was a uh, clearly a situation of unrest um, in Turkey that uh, is a cause for concern for us. We took steps to protect our people and, uh, and our facilities, uh, and I think that was the appropriate thing to do in light of the circumstances. So you don't think that the force protection measures that uh, were upgraded taken like a little bit late? We, as you know, force protection is something we take very seriously. Uh, we already had taken steps uh, we had an ordered departure of uh, dependents sometime earlier. So we have taken steps to make sure our people are as safe as possible. And I'm, I'm not going to second guess the UCOM commanders for elevating the force protection level to an even higher level in light of what had taken place in Turkey. Yes, Jenny. Thank you, Peter. Uh, did China currently join the ongoing uh, LIMPAC military exercises in Hawaii? Chinese because Chinese don't want to join any exercise with the United States because of you know, U.S. Uh, SAD system uh, deploying South Korea. Uh, I don't have the full readout here, but my understanding was there were Chinese naval ships participating in RIMPAC this year. So who's leading these operations, RIMPAC operations? I'm sorry? Who, who's, who's leading it? it? Well, you know, there are multiple nations I involved here, but this is a U.S.-led exercise. Um, but there are multiple countries involved. If you want, I can get the full uh, number, but it's, uh, it's substantial. Uh, if, you, if you bear with me, I might even have it right here. Um, I don't have it, but I'm happy to get it. But I, it's multiple nations, and it's an exercise, as you know, um, the biggest we do in, in, in that part of the world, uh, and, uh, and one that's been a big success in terms of uh, promoting interoperability between ourselves and other uh, countries in the region, and again, an opportunity for us to, to work uh, with the Chinese military uh, in a way that uh, hopefully improves understanding and, uh, and uh, our mill-to-mill -mill, uh, relationship. So how long will it take to do the exercise? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'll double-check the, uh, the exact timing of it, but it's an extensive, it lasts for multiple days, um, and I'm happy to get those questions and have it fully answered for you. Yes. Um, with the reported arrest of the, the Turkish uh, commander at the air base, uh, can you give us a timeline of how that transpired and whether there was a period at which the U.S. Uh, military presence had no interlocutor there at the base? How did it cope with that? 
Um, I, I'll leave it to the Turkish authorities to describe uh, if there was an arrest made by Turkish law enforcement. I'll leave it to, to them to describe. We have, um, as you know, a presence that's been at Incirlik for some time. Um, and I'm not aware of any problems we had in terms of engaging and understanding what was going on. We've been able to arrange for the resumption of flight operations. We've been able to, again, uh, have these conversations about trying to restore power to the base. So um, obviously there were events in Turkey that were uh, playing out over time on Friday, and there were uh, questions being raised about uh, uh, several aspects of the Turkish government and what was happening. And so obviously our folks had questions, but uh, we're satisfied now that our people are safe and accounted for. And uh, our operations, again, we're hoping to maintain them as we were before this uh, took place. We are still working to be able to do that. Were any munitions moved out of the base? Uh, I'm not going to get into any discussions about uh, our the safety precautions, security precautions we took. Any shots fired at the base? Any signs of violence uh, on the Turkish side of the base? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Um, and uh, so. L lastly, did the U.S. take any action? As my colleague over here um, cited, uh, you know, possible Turkish involvement from the base to support the coup. Did the U.S. do anything to try to halt that? Um, I'm not aware of. Uh, I'm not aware of every allegation that's been depicted here as to what uh, the activities of the Turkish people. This remember, this is a Turkish airbase in which we occupy a portion of that airbase. So I'm going to leave it to the Turks to describe the activities and actions of their personnel on that base. Nancy. Um, I want to follow up on a couple of the questions on Turkey. I'm having a hard time understanding how the U.S. is going about asserting force protection. You've said there are 3,000 personnel there, including 100 dependents. You said the U.S. was caught by surprise by the attempted coup. Um, the power has been cut off. Um, there's been some sort of, um, there's been reports of an arrest there. I'm having a hard time understanding how the U.S. is making an assessment of force protection at Insulik when the Secretary hasn't called his Turkish counterpart. I, I just don't understand how you're making those assessments when you clearly didn't have the intelligence in place to know that this attempt was going to start. How are you making these assessments? And in Tim's questions, you weren't able to answer about things about whether shots were fired, anything. Can you walk me through how the U.S. is actually making its assessments on force protection if it's not even engaging its Turkish counterparts in terms of what happened? It's a daily conversation, regular conversations, Nancy, between the commanders, uh, UCOM and CENTCOM as well, with folks on the ground at the base who have the best view of what's happening at that particular moment in time. And they receive regular updates. The secretary was updated as well. And uh, again, remember, this is... Uh, a base that is a Turkish airbase where they provide the perimeter security and there is further security uh, within that base for our personnel and we were taking the appropriate steps to make sure our people were safe and uh, we're satisfied that that was done. Everyone's been accounted for, which we're pleased with, and uh, we'll continue to have a conversation with the Turks about maintaining the safety and security of our people going forward, which is uh, incredibly important to us. But at what level? Is the conversation happening between the United States and the Turks? And who precisely briefed the Secretary on the security situation at Insulik? Um, I'm not going to provide you the names of the people the Secretary spoke to uh, regarding this, but you can be sure that uh, his top commanders. Some level, what levels we're talking about? Regular conversation with his commanders, including uh, General Scaparati at UCOM, General Votel at Central Command. Um, there have been conversations again with commanders at the base itself and our other personnel within Turkey. Uh, and of course, uh, very close conversations with uh, uh, the President's entire national security team. As you know, Secretary, the Secretary of State spoken to the, uh, the Foreign Minister. Um, so we've had conversations, we've had uh, uh, a, a clear assessment of what the situation is now with regard to safety and security for our people, and that was our primary concern throughout this entire process was making sure our people and our facilities were safe and their dependents as well. And then can I go back to Barbara's question, please, on the shootings that have happened in the United States now, two of them involving um, veterans of the United States military. There was a report in the Dallas Morning News that Micah Johnson, the man involved in the Dallas attack, didn't receive the kind of support he needed from the Army as he left, that he hadn't heard from leadership. 
Um, and I'm just curious, you mentioned earlier that you didn't feel that there was a need to do any sort of additional investigation because there's nothing to believe that one's mili their military careers contributed to um, these shootings. I'm curious if at a service level, if there's anything being investigated in terms of um, post-service um, post care, if there's any sort of assessment going on at a service level. When you said that there wasn't any need to investigate, is that at an OSD level or is that at a service level as well? Um, what my point to, to Barbara was that in terms of a direct connection between their military service and what's taking place, I'm not aware of a direct connection. That's the only point I was making there. Right. That subsequently that you didn't that where there was no need for an investigation given that there was no link that that could be seen and I'm just curious is that at an OSD level or is that at a service level that that determination? Oh, as you know uh, Nancy these people were beyond their active duty service with the Department of Defense and uh, so there's limits as to our contact with these people of course there was relationship uh, with the VA um, and so I'm not aware of a specific situation of the specifics of this case in which they had asked for uh, direct contact with with us or that this had been an issue so if it was then um, uh, I would refer you to the Army or in this case uh, the Marine Corps uh, but uh, they provided you the information they can on the active duty service of these individuals in the reserves uh, service as well Tony and then Question is the, is the Pentagon providing any support to the GOP or the Democratic conventions? Any intelligence or logistics support? Um, uh, Tony, let me take that question and get back to you. I I don't have a great answer for you right here. I, I want to make sure I can answer that as uh, authoritatively as possible. Yes, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Tim Johnson from McClatchy Newspaper. Jim, nice yes. to see you. Nice to see you. Um, I, you know, I I have to say I'm pretty surprised at this. Um, at least the sensation I get is that there was very little contact at upper levels between Turkey and the U.S. government. Certainly the Pentagon in the first, what, uh, 72 hours after this coup. Can you describe any I, contact I am, or how? Uh, again, I'm not going to read out the conversations that all of the commanders who have regular contact with their Turkish counterparts, whether it be uh, through UCOM or Central Command, um, there were conversations happening. I'm not going to provide you and cannot provide you the TikTok and detail in each and every one of those conversations. But you can be sure we were trying to find out exactly what was happening uh, using all the resources at our disposal to do that. Um, and that included mill to mill uh, conversations to make sure we knew what was happening on the ground and to make sure our people were safe. And then that was being done. I just cannot detail each and every one of those to you. I can provide you a picture of uh, the information the secretary was getting. Uh, but I can assure you um, from meetings that I participated in and, and uh, others that took place that there was an active effort to find out exactly what was happening, to find out uh, the status of our personnel, uh, and to make sure that everything possible was being done to make sure our people were safe and that this situation, that we had a good grip on this situation, which was, as I said at the top, was a surprise to us. Yeah. Was there any reason why the Secretary of Defense didn't pick up the phone, pick up the phone and call his counterpart? Uh, again, we were, had commanders uh, on the ground who were responsible for this area, uh, and it was at that time uh, the decision. They were in the best means to have uh, an understanding of what was happening at that time, and that's what they did. Tara. Quick follow-up. Um, all personnel have been accounted for. Can you assure the public that all U.S. weapons, small arms, ammunition, aircraft have also been secured and accounted for? Um, uh, as I said before, we've taken all the appropriate steps we feel we need to take to ensure the safety of our, our people, uh, dependents, military and civilian personnel, as well as the facilities. Uh, so what about the weapons? Uh, we've taken all those steps that we need to take to make sure that uh, everything uh, that we control in Turkey is uh, safe and secure. Yes. Okay, uh, the one thing, can you go back? You've mentioned the power supply several times, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I really do understand. If you, and if you can't say time frames, but if you have to stay on generator power, does that itself become a limiting factor in continuing full, trying to get back to full operations and continuing full operations? In other words, does there come a point when you have to be back on the commercial power system or you can't really get back to full 
operations. Is lack of power, is the reliance on generator power a limiting factor? Um, I don't believe it's a limiting factor right now, but I think, Barbara, I think it's safe to say over time uh, that it could become a limiting factor. Um, but at, at this moment, I'm not aware that it is. The concern would be if it were a protracted period of time that we would potentially have to make adjustments. Andy, one last question. You've said a couple of times um, that the Secretary was uh, surprised by the coup Friday night. What – I don't even know how to ask it. I mean, a coup in a – a military coup in a NATO country where the U.S. maintains uh, a very sophisticated stockpile of weapons and the Secretary of Defense genuinely surprised. How is this anything other than a significant failure in military intelligence? Because there were over 3,000 Turkish personnel involved in it. It wasn't like one random act. How, how does he view this? I can't imagine he's too happy about being surprised by this. So how does he view this as anything other than a failure in intelligence? Um, as you said, uh, I think it was not just the Department of Defense, but others who were surprised uh, by the events that played out on Friday. Uh, and there will be, uh, I'm sure, an effort to uh, assess if there was – should have been more information that, uh, that we should have obtained previously. Um, but we reacted as we did to the facts as we knew them, uh, to the reality on the ground, and that's where we are today. And the Secretary is focused on – uh, making sure our operations continue, that our people are safe and secure, and that our relationship with uh, Turkey, again, uh, continue to, to progress. Is it an intelligence failure? I'm not going to uh, label the events in Turkey any particular thing, Barbara. This was obviously something that uh, uh, points to um, issues within Turkey itself that I think are best left to the Turks. Yes, Lucas. Is it a – did the U.S. lose an ally when the commander of the Incirlik Air Base was arrested? Um, our ally is – NATO ally is Turkey itself. Um, so I'm not going to get into the individual members of the, the military. Our, our ally is Turkey. Our relationship with, is with the country of Turkey. Did it bother the Secretary that uh, since Turkey is this NATO ally, member ally, that our – U.S. military's colleagues on the ground while they were helping the United States and, and the coalition fight ISIS, they were also plotting a coup in their spare time? Um, again, Lucas, I'm not going to get into uh, the goals or ambitions of uh, individual members of the Turkish military. I'll leave that to the Turkish officials to, to describe. Paul and then Jamie Ohm. A quick follow-up on Barbara and Nancy's question about the um, – shooters in, in Dallas and in Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. Has there been any effort on behalf of the Pentagon to look at um, – it's not just uh, Dallas and Baton Rouge. There have been other instances and other instances where military mm -hmm. veterans have been involved in, in violent shootings, um, the D.C. Snipers, Washington Navy Yard, um, Fort Hood. But there's a number of other, other examples of this of active or former um, – former active duty or former military folks involved. Is there any effort on behalf of the Pentagon or any interest in looking into whether there's any connection here and there's anything that can be done to possibly mitigate that or that is just not, that's not on the table at all? Um, a couple things. We are a very large organization, as you know, um, with uh, literally millions of people who have served uh, in the past. We, uh, in that sense, that there are, there are many people in this country who have uh, served the U.S. military. So um, I just make that broad point. We're a big organization. Big organizations have, um, uh, at, on occasion, people who have done uh, bad things. Uh, so we're not unlike other institutions. Um, with regard to the specific question you have, I, I, I'd have to take the question to see if there's ever been uh, a formal review. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of one. Um, but obviously the, the idea or, or the discussion that we've had and uh, Secretary Carter and others have been part of it uh, in looking at how service members transition from active duty to, uh, to non-active uh, status, obviously the relationship, the handoff between uh, the active duty Department of Defense to the Veterans Administration, that's something that's been an ongoing conversation, something we've uh, been very eager to try and, and as has the VA in trying to make sure that that relationship is, uh, is as solid as possible and that transition is done as successfully as possible. 
And so in that broad context, uh, I'm sure that's a conversation we've been having, but not necessarily because of these individual shootings. It's something that it's the right thing to do for our service members. And I think that's what we're most uh, concerned about. Um, so, Jamie? Peter, I just, um, I'm sorry, but I have to ask this question sort of straight out. Um, Tony referred to special weapons and Barbara referred to sophisticated weapons. Arms control advocates uh, allege that the United States uh, has a small stockpile of nuclear weapons at the base in Inserlik, and they say that given the instability in Turkey demonstrated by this attempted coup, that it would be prudent to remove those weapons and either bring them back to the U.S. or put them someplace else. What, if anything, can you say about that? Uh, Jamie, as you know, as a matter of policy, we don't discuss uh, our strategic assets, uh, and uh, but you know as well uh, the kind of uh, uh, thought and uh, care that we put into safely and securing um, every part of the U.S. military, and we're going to continue to do that. Last question. Um, you say that while well, Secretary Carter is somehow briefed by his commanders on the ground, and also the dialogue between the military to military, between Turkish military and the U.S. military was also conducted through the disc commanders. But I don't know how to ask it, but uh, it may be a little bit uh, straight out, but wouldn't it be a little bit kind of secretary to call his counterpart, saying that, look, dude, your country and your government faced something like this, and I am a little bit sorry for you, but then um, we, as the ally, NATO ally, we are committed to our security strategic partnership and so on. Uh, there were, as you know, there were conversations between uh, the Secretary of State and uh, the Foreign Minister. Um, and the Secretary has spoken recently to his counterpart. He will be speaking with uh, representatives from the Turkish government at this event on Wednesday that he knew was coming up. And he's open to having a discussion at any point with uh, the Minister of Defense. Uh, this was a obviously very uh, unusual event. Uh, there's been a lot of turmoil in Turkey. Um, there's been a lot of effort on the part of the Turks uh, to try and, and uh, find out what's been going on, including, I'm sure, at the Ministry of Defense. So uh, there's been a significant amount of uh, engagement, and there will be going forward. And I'm sure the Secretary and his, uh, and his uh, minister counterpart uh, will engage in conversation. Okay. Thanks, everybody.